Phil Harding. Um, here we are. So, yeah, Hi, yeah. yes. <laughs> Interview number two. Ten years later, is it? Mm. Oh, yeah. I missed the first one. He was one of the originals. Was he? Yeah. Mm. Oh, Thank you very much. Did you interview him then? Yeah, but uh, with the camera off. You know, yeah. uh, I was off camera. Oh, but yeah. seriously, it's people like you that help make it all get so set up. There's a sort of postage size stamp, quick time, one frame per second That's video views there. Excellent. <laughs> Which many people have seen. <laughs> I managed to miss it. I'm sorry about that. That's fine, man. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I haven't done my research probably, clearly. Oh, well. Um, so, well, tell us how you got into the business then, Phil. Did you, did you train musically or in any related thing when you were at school? Did you have musical instrument lessons? Uh, yeah, I suppose I did, yeah. I was, I was quite late coming to music in as much as I had a piano at home. Musical and, parents? And uh, mother played piano a little bit, you know, as, a, as an East End mother would. You know, we were in uh, Romford in Essex. I went God to school, school in Dagenham in Essex, God my mate. Me. And uh, at 14, uh, had an encouraging music teacher that, that then started giving me lessons. Right. Uh, and funnily enough, I, I always thought that I only got to grade two, but I found a grade three certificate uh, oh. a, amongst my uh, papers <laughs> the other day. So, <laughs> hey, grade three on the piano. Um, and I found myself all, all these years later going back to piano lessons because I've forgotten how to read the dots. Oh, right. You know, and I thought... Uh, you actually had lessons again, have you? I'm, I'm having lessons again at the right, moment, right. yeah, and, and, and playing a bit of the sort of classical stuff. How oh, you? Having, having left that behind as a 16-year-old mm. uh, and gone totally into kind of, you know, the rock and the pop oh, yeah. uh, and thought, oh, you know, I've got to that grade. Uh, that's, that's enough yeah, yeah, to yeah. ground me, as yeah. it were. Yeah. Um, so as a 16-year-old, decided that I uh, didn't want to stay on for A-levels. I'd started playing in bands. Uh, so piano was my main instrument at that yeah. point. Uh, I thought, well, if I can possibly get a job in a studio, uh, that would better my chances. And what did you know about the studios at the age of 16? I mean, is it? Nothing. Absolutely zero. <laughs> zero. I didn't own a tape recorder at home. Knew nothing about recording whatsoever. I mean, what gave um, the idea about working in a studio? Then? Do you remember? Just the fact I was a musician and started yeah. writing songs, had a band together. I thought, well, uh, that that'll be fun. I, I think at the time I might have had a Saturday job in uh, an electrical shop, yeah, or something, and and heard someone like Jethro Tull on the radio being interviewed and right, talking yeah. about having their own studio. Yeah, I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go for a bit of that if we can. So how did you actually make this happen then? Did so you... well, so then I said it to the careers officer, right? You know, in uh, Eastbrook School, Dagenham, Essex, and looked at me as though I was a complete lunatic. Yeah. But uh, sent me off to a couple of interviews in in central London. Really? What must have been a wow. very early, uh, this was 1973, yeah. a very early video filming studio. Good heavens! Which hard to believe these days yeah. that they existed back then but that obviously they did yeah. uh, and then he sent me to a place can't remember the name of it on Wardour Street right. which was a uh, cable and connector right. uh, manufacturer and, and, and seller yeah. um, and they were there for many more years but basically they said to me look we don't think maybe you're technical enough uh, mm. for, for this job but we hear that the studio behind us which was the marquee yeah. uh, has, got, has got a space for a T-boy assistant right so I uh, got straight on the phone when I got home to the Marquee studio manager, uh, Jerry Collins was his name, managed to get myself interviewed the next day, 20th of 20 people that they really intended to wow. interview, and, uh, and 24 hours later got the job. How marvellous. You know, how your life can turn around in, in 24 hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and walked into this kind of wonderful world. I mean, I was a completely bemused 16-year-old. Yeah. And, you know, un un unlike, you know, as we see here these days, the the T-boy assistants in most studios, large studios in those days, were in a different room. Yeah. So your engineer, producer, musicians, obviously, in the in the studio, and a tape room. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we still have machine rooms, but the assistant was in that machine, machine room. room yeah. But a bit bigger, you know, a machine a machine room that was probably this size yeah. with, with our tech monitoring, uh, all the tape machines there, intercom into the studio, uh, all the tea making facilities in the kitchen. Like, so, like so the engineer would press the button on the intercom and go, uh, Phil, can you drop this in at the punch in at the third chorus so on track if, four? If you were trusted enough to punch in, uh, but he he did have a you know a machine remote in his room as well, right. so he would yeah. generally do most of the punching in, mm. and you would sort of change tapes, run around getting uh, tea sandwiches and so on, and be called out to set up microphones and so on when yeah. they needed changing. 
So, uh, and that was. And who, were you, who was the engineer you were generally working with, <clears throat> or were there a mix? Was it an in-house? Uh, yeah, it was all in-house engineers in those days. The the three engineers that I trained under were Jeff Calver. Oh yeah. Uh, months. Yeah, Phil Dunn, who engineered for Gustajan right. largely, and a guy called Will Roper. Yeah. And who did you learn the most from? Uh, probably equally Phil and Jeff. Yeah. Probably technically from Jeff, and probably tips, hints, and how to deal with clients from Phil. Yeah. Phil was quite a quite a character. Yeah. Used to arrive in a full suit with a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it was still the sixties. Yeah. Uh, 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 and that, but and that was his image, and that was, you know, he was. He, I mean, he was. You know. He'd smoke dope and he'd do all the rest of the things and, you know, be be a great friend to to all the musicians and producers. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't a straight laced character no, yeah. as he he was just flamboyant. Yeah, yeah brilliant. You know? yeah. Uh, and of course the very flamboyant Gus Dudgeon, as we yeah. remember him. You know, he's he's wonder, wonderful flamboyant dress sense. Mm. Uh, you know, just like he and Phil were a match made in heaven. With yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Phil was a great engineer. He'd 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 cut corners more than you'd see someone like Jeff cutting corners as it were uh, and get results mm. and I think that 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 the art of doing that put me in good stead for for later on when I when I was doing a lot of fast pop turnaround yes. work where, so, yeah, so did you, know, you get kind of promoted to engineer at the marquee at some point or yeah, did, yeah 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 I was 12 years at the marquee so mm, wow. uh, four or five years of training and uh, there were two other tape ops at the time that I arrived, so they they were ahead of me, as it were, mm. in, in in the pecking order. John Eden was one of them. He went on to engineer for Pip Williams and went on to produce himself. And the other guy was Steve Holroyd, who went on to do quite a lot of stuff, engineered for for Gus, and has ended up working for Universal in America. Right. So uh, yeah, a lot of people trained there at that time, mm. still in, still in and around the industry. So you must have done a huge industry. variety of different projects when you started, started engineering. Uh, yeah, I mean, 73, uh, I started there. So four years later, 77, 78, in the middle of the disco boom and the start of the punk explosion. Yeah. So quite, quite something to, and, and quite, you know, those things quite diverse. Yeah. Um, when I first started, we were still in the the process of the of the three hour session. Right. You know, ten was to, fairly strictly yeah, regimented. Yeah, ten to one backing tracks, uh, two to five overdubs. After that would be vocals and mixing, and 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 this continuous stream of session musicians coming through who had their own roadies, and yeah. it was it was quite um you know quite a little routine and factory where uh, you you had to learn to work fast mm. and. And, and the toughest sessions were, we used to do a lot of those kind of copy Top of the Pops yeah, yeah, albums, yeah. which were like a three day affair, often across a, a maybe a weekend, but certainly only three days. And where, when you were doing those, did, did you copy the original record onto the multi-track to play along to? No, the original record was always in the control room for right. the producer to, but usually the producers of those were, were um, orchestral or, you know, arrangers of some yeah. kind that had, you know, they'd had to, to get it done in three days, everything was scored out. Yeah. But as, as an assistant, which, you know, which rings true in my memory, is it, everything would go down at once. Right. Orchestra right. and band. Wow. Uh, and it wasn't a massive studio at a marquee. No. So the little kind of, you know, uh, so a little string section uh, a drum booth in the corner and everything as screened off as possible and orchestra out in the open space. Um, and all of that would go down in the sort of the first day, then all the vocals the next day, and then all the mixing the third day. <laughs> that was it, job done. Yeah. That's a great, great way to learn. Brilliant. The great thing about the punk revolution was that bands would come in, and part of the revolution was to have no producer. Yeah. <laughs> Where, you know, that I, uh, yeah, That's so, so it was like book us a studio, we'll have whoever the house engineer is, and we'll produce ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so I went through some very hairy <laughs> sessions. Uh, the one that sticks out in my memory most is the, is the first Killing Joke album, right? Oh, right, yeah. And, you know, a and our guy would turn up with a couple of crates of, of, of beer and champagne the first day of recording, and uh, no instruction other than, you know, good luck, Phil, here's the band. <laughs> Off we go. <laughs> 
you know, and I remember, uh, you know, wonderful guys, all wonderful guys, yeah. but with no central kind of leading figure either in the band or in. Was in, it in expected that you would kind of produce then? Not. Uh, it was expected that I would technically and creatively get down what the band wanted, uh, you know, best I could. Yeah. And it was expected that the band. You know, could and should produce themselves. Yeah. Uh, but the the idea of their idea of production was that each member would come into the control room, you know, and stare at me from that side of the desk during a playback, screaming at me to get whatever their <laughs> instrument was louder than anyone else's. <laughs> Especially the keyboard player, right. singer, jazz. Yeah. Scream at me. Yeah. Absolutely scream at me, and it's like we're only recording. You know, it's not the final balance, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was good fun. You know, I yeah. really enjoyed it. Youth was in the band, yeah. and uh, it was quite quite an exciting time. You know, you know, for instance, again on that album, we ended up using the marquee upstairs mix room to do the mixes, uh, and no one liked the mixes that we did, uh, and I I was convinced that it was only because we'd all got ourselves mentally into this space and. Uh, playback environment while during recording and everyone was like really really happy with that from yeah. from band through to record company through to friends popping in and out and right. so on um, and then this slightly more sterile smaller room that we had upstairs just 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 didn't suit it mm. and you know I, politically um, I had to kind of go back to the record company and say look I really think we've made a mistake by moving upstairs and, right. and, I, and I think the reason that the band and yourselves are not happy is 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 because we've moved out of the environment where we were happy. Right. Um, that was very astute of you to. Yeah, I think early pick sort of yeah, and I persuaded the studio to give us a day hmm. to mix downstairs. Right. Uh, I think you know without charging the client, and I and I'd said to the studio, look, I think we can get the whole album mixed here yeah. if maybe we, we you know we're allowed to go back downstairs. Um, was there any automation on the, any of these? Consoles? Yeah, this was on MC, MCI. We were right. on the MCI J five hundred, yeah. which had a, a, a kind of a yeah. you know its crude version of bouncing it from track to track. Uh, yeah, with the yeah. code from yeah. track to track and, and a bit of fader movement and mutes on and off. So yeah. you, you could do a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we we came out with a much better mix on that day and finished the whole album. Right. We didn't mix the whole album in a day, did you? No, no. <laughs> but then went through the whole, and then part of the punk revolution was to put no credits on the album. Yeah. So neither the studio nor myself were ever credited for, for anything on the album, but there you go. I can assure you I was there. Yeah. <laughs> and did it. Mike Stock, Matt Eakin, and Pete Waterman were talking about their own studio setup. Mm. And talking about, you know, myself going with them yeah. and, uh, uh, we took the maintenance engineer might pick in and we took two assistants right, wow. and uh, it was quite obviously disruptive to the marquee. Yeah, broke my contract, got out of there and became chief engineer at PWL Studios, uh, the Vineyard in the Borough, yeah. which was previously the Vineyard Studios. Okay. Uh, and they were in the process of kind of turning that round into a new studio setup. So it was, it was just the right time for a team like us to go in and say, right, you know, we don't we don't want to hire the studio. We want to, you know, Pete wanted to pay a rent, and take it over, have yeah. our own equipment. Right. Chose yes to sell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious choice at that time, 1985. Yeah. This was uh, SSL was was the console of choice for for pop production really, yeah. and that's what we were doing. Pop. So, and uh, never looked back. Basically, from that from that point onwards. Um, so you were pretty much. Mix engineer for most of the projects then. What you yeah, used? it was only only when it was kind of something major going on, like the, the, the Dead or Alive for CBS at the time was considered a major project for the guys. So I I engineered the recording of that mm. as, well, as well as mixing certainly the first three or four tracks. But where possible, because um, I even at that time I was I was doing early productions and and had other mixes going on. Yeah. Uh, and wasn't always available, so and Pete and the boys were generally quite happy to to you know use other recording engineers. Yeah, the recording engineers that we had at PWL were, were very much guys that uh, we had trained up, mm. you know, from being assistants. Yeah, uh, and anyone that came in with some experience were, were other mix engineers. Uh, Dave Fall and Pete Hammond in particular, mm. the only kind of outside guy that 
that had some experience that came in was Mark McGuire. Yeah. Uh, he came over from Abbey Road, uh, but mainly had been, you know, learning his trade there as an assistant. Mm. Uh, and I think most of the other people we, we had trained up. Yeah, so so it's quite, you know, became quite a routine of, hence the nickname Factory, mm. the hit factory, you know, factory-like production. Of, so at yeah. this point, what was what was the style of music that you aspired to work on? And, and was the PWL sound something that you feel you helped create? Or was it something that you were co copying? Or, you know, what yeah. guided you? And, and what, you know, what was your take on it all? Well, I, you know, I was there from day one, so I did, I did help create it. And... And, and, and the creation of the various genres of sound that we went through. I mean, it was all pop dance, but, you know, we went from sort of 125 BPM, high energy disco, down to Princess R&B through to Chicago House. Yeah. Stuff. You know, we went through lots of different yeah, styles yeah, whilst we yeah. were there, but although people tend to a, say there's, there's, yeah. there's one overall sound. Um, and it was quite a different sound from records that have been in the charts up to that point. Yeah, and, and and each time there was one of those changes, I was I was generally, you know, quite involved in helping to to shape. What guy did you then? Did you go out clubbing? And to... uh, no, it was always Pete. You're right. Pete Pete was the one that went clubbing. Yeah. You know, still DJ'd. Did he ever uh, drag you out of an evening and say, "Come out and listen to this"? No, really, he'd bring it in. He'd just bring the records. He'd in. bring he'd bring stuff in. I mean, yeah. Pete would spend his weekends. He'd go back up north on a Friday. Uh, he'd spend a Saturday morning doing a radio show right. on the local Liverpool radio station. He'd spend his Saturday afternoon in uh, an independent record shop in Manchester, yeah. seeing what people are coming in. Yeah. And he'd spend his Saturdays, Friday and Saturday evening, in clubs, either DJing or going to clubs, right. and then feeding that back into the team on a, on a, on a Monday. Because the impression I got, yeah, because the impression I got, you, you got left to your own devices to do a lot of these 12-inch mixes. Yes. Which is a very club-specific structure format you know yeah. in terms of the song structure and it yeah and it, and it was quite strange for someone like myself a sort of you know a trained engineer you know non-dj mm. to be doing that and sometimes if i'd go to like you know dj conventions or, or i got asked to judge at the dmc dj championship <laughs> one you? year you know <laughs> so, and and thank god you know i was surrounded by djs people yeah. like ben lebron that that were remixes, but coming from being DJs and so on, yeah. that would tell me what on earth's going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was just it was just one of those things, you know. Myself and, and Ian kind of just got into a routine of, you know, engineer, producers, programmer. Ian was yeah. a great musician and programmer, and just uh, the enthusiasm to to, to do that stuff. Mm. Uh, but what uh, gave you the judgment to know where to put the breakdown in the twelve inch and things? Was it purely copying other records that did it already, or was it what? Yeah, Pete I, yeah, said? I suppose so. Yeah, I mean, you know, we st we st we started off basing the Divine Sound on Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Yeah. You know, and then Dead or Alive came in and said we want to sound like Divine and Hazel Dean. You know, and and and, and each yeah. time you kind of you're either you know copying someone else's sound or your own sound. Mm. It just develops as you go along, and then. And then you end up with, you know, hopefully your own sound. Yeah. Uh, and developing, you know, routines where you know you know what the DJs want, you know, mm -hmm. and you give them a chance to, a good chance at the beginning to mix in, a good chance to mix out in the middle, and and every opportunity to to go through to the end, but then to still mix out, you know, yeah. it's not it's, that's what's that's not yeah. not brain surgery really, no, I but so. but um, I think um, increasingly myself and Ian. Did used to go out to yeah. clubs uh, once, you know. Once we can't, I mean, we we kind of were the SAWB team, production wise, but we we were very much, uh, you know, high level remixes throughout the eighties yeah. that did a lot of non PWL stuff, um, you know, from Jesus Jones through to Debbie Harry and Pet Shop Boys and all the rest of it. We would regularly go over to the New Music Seminar in New York, which became a good learning ground mm. for both what was going on, how our records mixed into other records that were going on, yeah. uh, and then the great networking thing of you know meeting all the sort of A and R guys and yeah. and, uh, and the managers and so on who, you know, unless they come down to the studio, you, you tend to become a bit faceless yes. to them. Mm. You know, and so I do recommend to people that you, you know, no matter how successful or busy you are, you you've got to get out of the box. Yeah. Sometimes. Right. And, and let people, you know, let people know that you're, 
you do exist and you're someone that uh, you know is okay to get on with and yeah. you know they can talk to you because often you know often you get to that stage and and most of the discussions between those uh, the business and the creative A and R guys go through your manager yeah uh, you know and, and a strict manager will actually discourage them from talking direct yeah to you which yeah. is quite strange sometimes for for both for them and for yourself so. Mm -hmm. I know you're mostly mixing, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, before auto tune was invented, yes. How, yeah. how did you cope with all that? What, what were the tricks? Well, it, you know, you'd always hope that the singer was up to it and could stay t and stay <laughs> in tune. You know, um, yeah. there's two two things there really. You, that you'd always rely on having your session singers come in, right, and give you plenty of backup. Yeah, you know. Uh, which would generally only leave you with an exposed couple of verses to do with, <laughs> right. you know, to get you know really down to the nitty gritty, yeah. and with the uh, as I refer to it in in in, in my book about P W L, and oh look, George is going to hold it up for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we ended up with just this one microphone, the Cowrex Soundfield yes. microphone, which. Uh, which was an interesting scenario, uh, oh, yeah. uh, but it, it, it well, that doesn't help you singing, do you? No, it had a great <laughs> it had a great sound, <laughs> and it seemed to work for everyone. Yes, and uh, you know, Mike Stock would generally be producing the the vocal sessions because and, and you good. really did use that mic all the time. Yeah, you, you sort of read it at the back of the sleeve and you go, yeah, yeah, I bet. That yeah, no, no, that was the only vocal, the really, yeah. only mic that we had capable of. Yeah. We might have had a Shaw fifty seven sitting around, but that was about it. Yeah, and well, we didn't record all the B format. Surround no, signals, no, right? no, no, just 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 the, the one front, the, the front, the front stereo format that we we would put down to mono. Yes, you know, bringing it up on on two channels on the SSL. Right. Uh, very. Oh, the only time we recorded it stereo was uh, a particular Rick Astley track oh, on right. the second album, where we knew it, we wanted to go for a single vocal without because the routine was to double track everything. Yes. Triple track if necessary, mm. or and or more. Mm. Um, so those, uh, those were the type of tricks, you know, the triple tracking, the tracking yeah, you yeah. know, and, 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 and always, you know, if it wasn't a great vocalist, always, you know, eight takes and then compiling it afterwards. Syllable by syllable. If necessary. By bouncing yeah. tracks. Line by line. Did you ever use harmonizers to help with a bit of tuning or anything uh, like that? Uh, only, only during the mix session. Right. Bit of bit of brightening up and on on, on the. And that was uh, blending a signal in rather than trying to actually pitch change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only only when the Akai came along could we do some, you know, the Akai sampler could mm -hmm. we do some drastic pitch changing. But um, do we didn't we didn't do that much of that. Not not till Ian and I moved moved over here to the strong room really. So. Um, and presumably it was all a bit clunky in terms of, sort of sequencing in those days. You know, I already used the Lin Nine Thousand. Now, yeah. I mean, my memory was it was that everyone said it never quite worked. The Lin Nine Thousand. It was continually breaking down. Right. So there was a continual process of like, you know, if the sequence is in there, then get it on tape while it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and 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 in what was mainly a two studio set up as far as main studios there were a few programming rooms as well yeah there, there were possibly four lin 9000s right doing the rounds of like studio maintenance room studio maintenance yeah. room um so that was the process so as long as long as the code was solid and obviously no we haven't got one in here but we had the wonderful uh src yeah. simty generator and reader really yeah which would be you know <coughs> solid as a rock and if that's yeah. solid as rock it's always going to drive the lin or or, mm. or or something else so you'd often have guide drums on tape to start with that may not become the final drums until the mix mm. um, and even then nearly always that at least the kick and snare would be something locked into the uh, mm. the, the AMS sample. So I guess that was the start of pretty much sort of running things live rather than having everything recorded and then mixing. Yeah. Because that was always a bone of contention when I, you know, when in the late 80s when I started working with Cold Cut, you know, you'd go around, they'd go, right, these are the drums, you'd record them, and half an hour later, oh, we've just checked, we've printed, yeah. and you'd yeah. go around in circles yeah. like crazy, recording Continu stuff. Continually reprinting. Until you sort of thought, hang on a minute, yeah. <laughs> that's a better way of doing this. Yeah, and, 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 and no commitment until the mix stage, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and apart from the bass and a few high-end keyboards that would need sequencing, uh, you know, most other keyboards would, would literally be played live to tape. Yeah, you know, by by Mike Stock or Matt or you know whoever else was right, around as a right. keyboard player. Yeah, uh, Matt Aiken would do guitars. You know, so a lot of lot of live played stuff yeah, would, would be really, there. Yeah, which you don't really get the impression 
presumably they were extremely tight players. Yeah, yeah, no, which very, obviously had a lot to do with it. Yeah, exactly. Very good players. So, um, and and only when uh, Ian Kerner came along, which was uh, at the latter end of eighty five, eighty six, willing to run the new Fairlight system, which the previous right. guy didn't didn't want to run, uh, and. You know, on by the time we got on to Rick Astley, uh, also some Mel and Kim, Ian was was doing some Fairlight stuff that would again just, you know, you you get it running in sync off the SRC and printed it tape and, and and that would be it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Ian would sequence, you know, like the strings and the brass on Nev Never Gonna Give You Up, Rick Astley. Uh, we got a wonderful rendition on uh, on Radio Two uh, last year with with you know the Steve Levine show. And Ian, you know, still has those samples to this day, right. and 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 you could hear very clearly, you know, what he had done, just just printing octave violins and so on, and yeah. um, you know, and Steve Levine kind of proved it, that, that with a Lin nine thousand and a few bits like that, they weren't difficult records to recreate. Hmm. You know, the original creation of them it would would be quite time consuming and. Hmm. Uh, you know, had its own way of going about things. But well, I suppose to, the ch things that change, we're, we're so lazy these days because it's so easy to just yeah. dial things up, isn't it? Yeah. And, and even, you know, and the singers who can't sing that great, we've got all the tools easily yeah. available to fix. Yeah. Uh, I, only only twice do I ever remember having to ghost lead vocals at right. like, PWL. That, that, that was your last resort yeah. of, of getting this, a session singer to, you know, not only do backing harmonies and so on for the chorus, but actually ghost the verse as well. So double track it effectively, so yeah. you've got a bit of the character of the person, but then yeah. singing it in tune, yeah. mixed in. Yeah. <laughs> bit drastic when yeah. you get to that level, you know. <laughs> wonderful when Auto Tune came along yeah. in the 90s. That Absolutely must have been wonderful. a date to remember. God, you know. <laughs> but then, you know, then, uh, you know, as it were, lower lower level singers could could, could get away with making records. Yeah. yeah. And is that, is that when you got fed up with it then, once you started realising? Um, no, it's it, late nineties. I got fed up with it. I suppose yeah. you know continually, you know. But and, and as we do now, you often spend a lot longer on your editing session. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got all the tools and it's wonderful, and you can get it all you know snazzy and perfect. But a lot longer than you do recording. Yeah. You know, whereas uh, you know that routine used to be okay. You know, we'll do we'll do eight takes and. You know, and then immediately after vocalist has gone, you'll you'll quickly compile that down onto one or two tracks, and mm. you know, and you move on. You make the commitment, you move on. Yeah. Uh, whereas now, you that commitment is you never quite have to make it with the technology we have now, uh, which is great in one way, but very time consuming in another. You know, I think there's there's probably many producers around in my generation that that hanker for the for the old days where during your recording process you make the commitment mm. that you don't look back and you move on. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of, you know, hung the headphones up for a few years at the end of the 90s because uh, I felt I got boy banded out. Yeah. You know, after PWL it was uh, over here at the Strong Room in the production suite and uh, once Ian and I had the success of E17 mm. with, with their early records and we went through the best part of three albums with them. You're right. We got uh, we got very much what I call industry pigeonholed yeah. into being you know it doesn't matter that uh, we might have worked with Jesus Jones or I'd engineered the Clash or Ian used to be in Talk Talk yeah. uh, boy bands was all we could do as far as the industry was concerned mm -hmm. uh, talking you know A and R and, and, and yeah. management and, and so on and personally uh, it just it got too much for me. I mean, Ian and I craved to record a female vocalist to the point where we, you know, we signed a girl ourselves to our yeah. own production company. Uh, you know, went out and played it to some record companies, and it was, oh, it's not the Harding Kerno sound that we know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we don't expect that from you. <laughs> We're great fun ourselves, do yeah. we? You know, yeah. but um, yeah, that's that for me. That's how that's how it gotten by then after after yeah. after twenty years of being like totally. In the world of pop, and, yeah. and then and, you, and the you've done some of your own material, which is more sort of acoustic, haven't you? Really Since then, years, yeah, yeah, because I think by the end of the nineties, I was I was hankering to get back to kind of where I was in the seventies well, and eighties, and, 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 and working <laughs> working with you know a, a set of musicians yeah. and and yeah. you know a real drummer instead of something programmed. I mean, we only ever recorded one drum kit at PWL between nineteen eighty five and nineteen ninety two. Mm. Uh, which was one sort of live drum session that, that Ian and I did for a, for a project, and we set the guy up down in 
down in Pete's mock Italian uh, 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 courtyard studio, yeah. <laughs> which was about the only space we had for a drummer to, to, to set up. And we had to hire the microphones in and uh, virtually the whole building came running down to see what nerve the bloody noise was because <laughs> it wasn't soundproof properly down there. And... Um, uh, you, yeah, could, you could remember how to do it, presumably. I could remember how... To, I, I remember when we were working actually here uh, with Let Loose and they had a great, you know, great live drummer. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I almost got myself into a panic attack about recording it because <laughs> it had been so long yeah. since I'd done it in it with any kind of regular routine, yeah. you know. And uh, I think I turned up to the session with with like a totally stiff neck where yeah. I got kind of we uh, it turned out great and it was of fun, course. you know. Um, but you know, there we were at Peter Well with a generation of assistants that never learned no. how to how to mic up a, a drum kit, which is one of the first things you do when yeah. you go to a, a college with a music technology course mm. these days. So I had a hankering to get back to, to, to that kind of creativity. Mm. And although I didn't uh, do it until kind of uh, recent years, really, I've really enjoyed working with, with, with live musicians again, you know. Yeah. Even though I've ended up with a routine of working with them kind of one musician at a time rather than a whole band. Um, but I have recorded a few bands recently as well. And uh, okay. yeah, yeah I, really, I really enjoyed that. You know, because it's a very creative process for an engineer and, mm. and, and a producer. Well, it's a social experience as well, isn't it? Yeah, and it, I really used to enjoy that in the seventies mm. and eighties. And and as an engineer, your your reputation was was you know made or broken on on, on how well you could do that. Not not well, mainly your drum sound. Yeah. But you know the kind of guitar sound you could deliver, uh, or not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed. Doing that yeah. actually, and I, and, and uh, I was just talking about being on a. This is the first pop project. This thing I'm doing uh, for like four or five years, and right. I, I never thought I would go back to doing right. uh, you know, yeah. God knows how many tracks in Pro Tools or whatever pop track. But uh, something's come along that's just caught my ear, and I, and I could see the potential in it. So yeah, um, well, presumably you can you can pick and choose a bit now and do what it takes. Yes, fancy. yes, yes. Well, you know, glorified shed at the bottom of my garden with yeah. it. Pro Tools HD setup, uh, not enough room to record a band, but uh, I've got a couple of studios where I'll go and record yeah. drummers or, or a band and so on, and then and then just bring it back home. Hmm. And I think that's that's probably your fairly average seasoned industry producer engineer these days, where you've got some sort of setup at yeah. home. And, and I think most musicians need that as well, because hmm. certainly on on the pop side of the industry at the moment. Uh, and, I, and I've done this with this production I'm doing at the moment. You expect musicians that you want to use to to have their own setup, mm. so that you can send them the files yeah. as a pop producer. I'm talking, yeah. and say, you know, yeah, I want you know six guitar tracks that sound something like this, and do whatever you fancy as well, and send me back the files, mm. and you don't actually get together. So, um, is that good or bad? I, I th there's <laughs> there's a bit of each. Yeah. I mean. Uh, Pretty much, I mean, it gives it gives the musician freedom. Yeah, requires that they need a certain amount of technical knowledge and ability themselves. Yes, obviously to run their own system and, and be compatible with what you send over to them. But um, and you know, unless they're in a different country, I will normally turn up and and physically get the files off them, yeah. review what they've done, and just see if there's anything you know while I'm there. Right. Yeah. Anything extra to, to to just chuck on? Yeah, put another you know. octave on in the middle eight. Yeah, or something. Or, yeah, or whatever. Or yeah. a, riff, a riff I had in my head that yeah. that, that, that hasn't come out from there. Right, you know. Right, right. Um, and and you're also now heavily involved in education. Yes, which is presumably a passion and something that you felt. It is. This is not something I ever sort of planned to get into. You know, uh, um, I remember it well. 1998, I did my first workshop master class at up at Lipper in Liverpool. Yeah. Which uh, well, is this something somebody asked you to do? That you thought... Yeah, I th well, Lipper is one of those places where they've got a lot of industry connections. Right. And uh, Benny Gallagher uh, uh, of Gallagher and Lyle became yeah. a good friend because uh, a couple of his sons have, have been assistants for right. me over the years, either at PWL or here at the Strong Room. And he'd been going up, and, as as Paul McCartney does, you know, going in and doing workshops for the students yeah. there. And he said, uh, Phil, you really should go up and just pass your knowledge on yeah. on the production side. To what was your attitude to that? I mean, cause you, having come up through the studio system without any official 
course training or anything. Yeah. You, you obviously didn't. I was, I was interested to, to see what they were doing and how they were going about it. You know, yeah. I was incredibly uh, nervous. But then, <laughs> but then again, um, it was in a studio, so I was in a comfortable environment. You know, uh, and I took up a, a 911 track that I'd been producing right. and just gave them uh, an example of what it's like going from the songwriter demo mm. through to, to the finished master, both on multi-track and, and, and within Cubase. And I just found the the, the the feedback that I got and the amount that I joined, enjoyed it was yeah. was not what I expected. No. You know, um, do you think we're training too many people to become recording engineers without a prospect for a job at the end of it? Uh, I think that you know that is a point that a lot of a lot of industry people uh, are concerned about. You know, I think that uh, any youngster going on a vocational course out of college or a university, it, it, he's going to get a good all-round grounding, regardless of of their prospects of actually getting a job as a as an engineer or producer. I, I, I don't. I don't think that's the main issue really. I think the main issue is that um, if the students uh, can enjoy the course and, mm. and, and, and get what they want from it. And I do find a lot of the students, you know, take from it what they want to get from it. Yes. You know, they're often musicians that, like I say, that, that want to be musicians actually, but mm. realise that they need the, the technology knowledge yeah. and background now to, to be successful musicians. Yeah. But I think anyone working in the music industry at the moment on, 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 a, on any kind of creative stroke technology side yeah. has had to be an all-rounder. Yeah. You know, you really, as a technologist, you have to have an understanding of music and be a musician, ideally. Well, I think that's, a, that, that's, a, knowledge, that's you know? a big change that's happened. Because, I mean, I remember when I first got a job at, at Livingston, I was, Jerry Boys very much discouraged me from having any interest in the musical side of things yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah. It was like, you're on that side of the glass. Don't yeah. talk to a guitarist about how his guitar's tuned. Yeah. Shut up and make the tea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or something we, like that. Yeah, which is much nicer. Which, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks very nicely to people, but you know. Yeah, and that very much was the way. And, uh, you know, you, you do have to say to students that um, if you do get an opportunity to go and do some work experience or, or get a job in a, in, in a studio environment, if people are not interested in your in your creative opinions, you know, you're there to do a job and to provide a service as everyone else in the room is, yeah. you know, and that's, and that is, that side of it is a difficult thing to teach. Yes. Because then it comes down to, you know, psychology, personality. Mm. Et cetera, well, do you think there should be psychology modules in these courses, perhaps? I, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea, not a bad idea at all, you know. Because that's go, the go, thing they don't touch upon at all, and that's the thing that's I right. probably found the hardest to learn as I came up through the studio system. Yeah, a couple yes. of weeks at a Buddhist retreat. Have, how not to offend people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, how, but how do you teach yeah. someone patience? Well, I don't know. 